PDP's Jan Dor files petition against Sonolu's victory. Ondo APC Ward suspends chairman over abuse of office. Clarify position federal government tells Peter Obi over leaked audio. 16 Ogun PDP Assembly candidates track APC INEC to tribunal. Tonight on the program, we'll be discussing ways of settling the tension that may have come up before and after the 2023 elections, just ahead of the inauguration of the president-elect Bola Ahmed Tirubu, expected to be on May 29th. This is Plus Politics. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. It's still plus politics. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. President-elect Ashiwa Jubola Tinubu has raised alarm over alleged plots by some aggrieved politicians to truncate the transition process, particularly his expected swearing-in on May 29th. Tinubu, in a statement by the spokesman of APC Presidential Campaign Council, PCC Festus Kayamu, also warned the presidential candidates of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Alhaji Atiku Abubakar, and that of the Labour Party, LP, Mr. Peter Obi against taking to the streets while also pursuing their cases in court. In the statement issued, the president-elect noted that those who have taken to the streets protesting against his mandate are fixated on having an interim national government, ING. Joining us live to discuss this is uh, um, Mr. Shegun Shokpeton, a political analyst, and we're hoping to be joined also by Taiwo Olakpade in the course of the show. But we're beginning with Mr. Shokpeton. Good evening and welcome to the program, Mr. Shokpeton. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, now the elections have come and gone. I'm not sure we're going to have another election again, except, uh, well, uh, the unthinkable happens. And now that we are at this point, May 29th is just around the corner, and we need to mend fence. Uh, we need to mend the bridges mend the fences and or whatever it is that we need to do to come back as one and move on as a nation. But it doesn't seem to be happening, especially within the political parties. We've seen where PDP here in Lagos has filed a petition against the uh, victory of Somolu and even, in fact, uh, the Labour Party that uh, they did not keep to the guidelines of INEC. We've seen in Ondo where APC Ward has suspended the chairman over abuse of office, as they're calling it. We've seen uh, where APC's... Uh, uh, accusing a Labour Party presidential candidate that there was an audio that was leaked and he needs to clarify that and this and that. Every small issue is either going to court or is becoming a very, very serious talking point within the parties and, you know, inside the, the parties and between parties and all that. We've also seen Labour Party. Now we are having someone who is parading himself as the authentic uh, or acting Labour uh, Party uh, chairman, national chairman. And we're just wondering what is really happening. How can we heal and move on as a nation? Let's first of all just look at what is happening within the parties. Why do you think there is this rise in suspensions, uh, anti-party, uh, and all those other things that the parties are accusing themselves and other parties of? What is giving rise to all of this after an election has been uh, won and lost. Well, um, thanks for having me again, and good evening, Nigerians. Um, look, yes, the elections have come. Um, yes, we can say they have gone. But it would appear as though, from everything that we see, um, you know, in the country now, that the elections are far from over, and uh, that that is unfortunate because it should not be so. The, the reality, no matter what anybody might say, that the elections are not over. Um, we've had elections um, of different colors, um, different flavors in the past, especially in this part of the public, just limit ourselves to that uh, time frame. And I think even when we had elections that were really, really terrible, uh, for example, the 2003 and the 2007 elections, I'm not sure I remember any time um, 
maybe with the slight exception of 2011, uh, where um, the mood in the nation has held so much uncertainty, where over a month after the presidential elections, um, there's still a lot of um, doubt you know, surrounding the transition, if you like. And uh, the question that we have to ask ourselves is why? You know, um, even for people that are supporters of the ruling party that um, INEC has declared the winner, they will admit that they are far from being in celebratory mood. They are far from resting, you know, and relaxing and trying to savour victory. Uh, they're still a combatant. There's still one controversy or the other every single day. They still have to respond to, you know, accusations. They are making accusations. You know, it's just the, the entire country is um, in a bit of um, a state of suspense in, at the moment. And, you know, you have to ask ourselves, why? And for me, I think the reason is very simple. I don't think that anybody, no matter... They, their coloration, no matter their leaning, political leaning, no matter who they support, I don't think anybody would um, continue to agitate if the electoral process that resulted in the outcome we have on our hands was transparent and patently, obviously fair. So that, that is where I believe we have problems. INEC promised certain things. INEC gave very firm assurances. INEC asked Nigerians to rest and relax that these elections will be free, will be transparent, will be credible, will be fair. Um, but for, from even the reports of a lot of international observers, you know, and some of our most credible local observers, the elections were anything but transparent. And even as I speak to you now, the upload of um, results, <laughs> results sheets on the IRF portal for the presidential elections is still not at 100%. You know, shockingly. You know, so um, I think that this has set the tone for what we have in the country now. Um, it has left um, a lot of people feeling extremely aggrieved. Like we said at the, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the elections, if you do the analysis, the simple mathematics, right, you find that for the first time in our political history, at least in the Fourth Republic, the winning candidate won less than 50% of the votes that were cast. Less than 50%. They won 36%, right? Um, the other two candidates, and it's also the first time that we've had the, the, the losing candidates sharing such a large proportion of the votes. So what that will do is that there's a large proportion of the electorate that are unhappy with the outcome. And that is what we're seeing now. You know, and that's where we're seeing a lot of uh, grievances being expressed. That's where we're seeing a lot of people saying things like uh, immigration must not hold, you know, and all of that. Um, I, I think that this is unfortunate. Um, sadly, there is very little that can be done about this other than to rely on, uh, you know, legal uh, processes that have been provided by the Constitution and the Electoral Act to redress, to seek redress, and um, and um, hopefully secure justice. Until that is done, I think all parties will simply have to try as much as possible to abide by the by the letters and the spirit of the law. Uh, we, we can't, because we're not happy with the outcome of elections, we can't throw the entire country into, into bedlam and chaos. If nobody's interest will be served by that. So I, I think that both from this, on the part of the winners, the APC, and on the losing side, the PDP and the Labour Party losing, at least, in, uh, you know, uh, according to INEC, I think everybody must shift their swords and um, try as much as possible to, to act with decorum so that we don't throw the country into anarchy leading up to the inauguration and, and afterwards. 
Uh, but I'm just wondering, uh, this is not the first time that elections, I'm not trying to encourage evil as it were, but this is not the first time elections have been rigged in this country. This is not the first time INEC chairman has promised us a very, very free and fair election. Morrissey Wood did the same thing, Jagat did the same thing, and uh, now uh, Yakubu did the same thing. They all promised us. So why is it like this is one of a kind? Why is this uproar happening? even after elections, so many weeks after elections, in fact, months after election, as it were. What is so special about this one? Well, look, what's, what's special is that hopes were raised. You know, before this election, you know, I belong to civil society, and I know the amount of work that we put in, um, in terms of voter education, public enlightenment, um, you know, and all of that, encouraging people to go get their voters' cards, PVC, the thing, your PVC is your power, and so on and so forth. We did that primarily because INEC, especially the INEC chairman, you know, was very um, reassuring in his body language, in his mannerisms, in his words. Um, the Electoral Act itself uh, presented a scenario that appeared to be potentially rigging proof. You know, if you look at the provisions of the law, um, when you combine the voter accreditation by Beavers, the method of accreditation by Beavers, the fact that we're moving away from the card reader where cards could fail, we're moving to biometric verification that depended on either your fingerprint or your face, recognition of your face, you know, the official features, um, combining that with transmission of results directly from the polling unit. This is very key. Transmission of results into the central server from each beavers and upload of results sheets into IREM from the polling unit, you know, and then you then continue from there with the standard, the old process of manual collation. Now, those three provisions that technology was going to, to, to introduce to give um, a scenario that assured people. And people believed a lot of, so you saw 10 million new registrations before this election. It was unprecedented. This was because a lot of people that had never voted before, that you know, probably would not have voted, listened to what we were saying you know, in civil society, what INEC was saying, talking about how much this election had moved us further into the future, um, how much uh, the, the provisions of the law and the technology and the guidelines that INEC had put out was going to prevent, you know, reading. Um, the, the, the outcome that we were confronted with and the manner in which it happened, the way uploads failed nationwide. You know, we have to um, just step back, sit back, and think about this. Uploads failed nationwide in 176,000 polling units simultaneously. You know, um, for anybody that is a technology enthusiast, you know that the chances of a 100% technology failure is very remote. So that immediately raised questions about manipulation and deliberate sabotage. And this, you know, once you have people having doubts, especially in a scenario where their hopes had been previously raised, you know, really, you know, everybody was raring to go. There was so much enthusiasm. People believed genuinely that the, their vote would count. And the person that they wanted to vote for and they wanted to see become president would emerge. When that hope was dashed in such brazen manner, and then in the aftermath of that election that was so controversial, the body language and the, la and the, and the conduct and the utterances of the winning parties um, exacerbated the feelings, the grievances that people were feeling, the malcontent, and made things just, just terrible. So, you know, so that is what has set the tone for what we are seeing now, where people are in an unprecedented manner. Some are even saying that the inauguration should not hold. That's how bad people feel. You know, so I think, you know, what set the tone for this is the amount of hope that have been created before the election and how much of an anticlimax the elections itself then turned out to be and how those hopes were dashed 
you know, um, hope deferred, make it the heart sick, the, the Holy Book says. So the worst thing you can do to a human being is to take hope away from them. When they become hopeless, it's as good as they're dead. And, you know, when a man feels that he's dead and there's no hope, believe me, there's nothing that he cannot do. Now, INEC is saying that uh, they did no wrong uh, because electronical, electronic transmission, rather, of results was not a must. They, they didn't need to do it. So they have done no wrong, and this election is credible, is fair, and whoever emerged, emerged credibly. Now, I don't know. They quoted a lot of uh, paragraphs, a lot of sections of, the, of, of whatever guided them to do the election. Uh, do you think we will still will ever get out of this if INEC continues this way. They have hired a lot of lawyers to, to also defend them in court and all that. And, you know, what do you think about that? They say they did no wrong at all. Um, I think INEC, INEC has um, bungled these elections badly. And to say they did no wrong is, um, well, you know, you would expect them to say that, but I think it's, um, it's uh, very unfortunately not true. Um, and I, I also must say, I've heard this argument so many times, and I laugh. Look, INEC is under compulsion. It is compulsory for them to transmit elections electronically. Their own guidelines said so. You know, we have to understand this. It, it's not optional. I've heard a lot of people say that, oh, it's not compulsory. The Electoral Act did not specifically say that the Constitution also did not specifically say that um, results must be transmitted electronically. But they fail to recognize that um, you know, when you are making laws, every law derives power from somewhere. So the Constitution derives its power from the people, from the mandate, from, the, from, 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 from our franchise, right? We vote for the National Assembly, and then they enact the Constitution and that constitution begins to guide us based on the franchise we gave to the National Assembly. And then every other law that we operate derives their power from the constitution. The Electoral Act derives its power from the constitution and lays out how INEC is supposed to conduct our elections. Now, that Electoral Act specifically stipulated that INEC won't shall. That's the word the Electoral Act said. Shall prescribe the method for which elections shall be conducted in the country. It's, it, it's a must. Now, INEC then, following that law, released the guidelines. By that token, the guidelines have become, have attained the force of law. The guidelines are an extension of the Electoral Act, which is an extension of the Constitution. The guidelines are a law. The guidelines in INEX guideline stipulated clearly that the results will be transmitted at the polling unit. It is very clearly spelled out in black and white, right? The transmission of results and upload of results, two very distinctly different things, were stipulated in those guidelines. It is the law. It is not optional anymore. INEC cannot change that rule midstream, just at their convenience. Now, those guidelines also specifically make provisions for collation of results. Please, let's make a distinction between transmission and collation. The transmission of results and the upload of results were supposed to be a control for the collation of results. Collation of results was meant to be guided, um, um, manual. Now, the collation of results, the guidelines stipulated clearly that results were going to be collated from the result sheets that were that had been uploaded already. That is the stipulation of the electoral, um, 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 sorry, the, the guidelines of INEC. Mm. Now, section 93 of those guidelines now made provision for situations where uploads failed or where electronic transmission failed. Mm. INEC was, is then required to go to the police and collect copies of the result sheet, EC um, uh, 38A, I believe that's the number, from the police. And that is what will be used for collation at the collation centers. 
So that is the only provision within the law where INEC would be expected to deviate from using the uploaded and transmitted results. INEC had or has to show the world that they did that. If they did not, then they have failed to comply with the law. And, you know, and, you know we will wait to hear what the opinion of the Supreme Court you know, on this. But I think that it's very simple, it's very straightforward. So INEC cannot say that, oh, we're at liberty to transmit if we so please. I'm sorry, they're not. You know, if that were to be the case, then uh, it, it simply means that INEC can just uh, do whatever they want based on their own whims and caprices, and then we would no longer have the rule of law. We would have the rule of chairman of INEC or the rule of INEC. So it doesn't work that way. Okay, uh, well, we will just take a short break, and when we return, we'll, be, we'll still be looking at what is going on right now. Uh, we cannot have a national, uh, interim national government that's from a lot of people who are saying no to interim national government. And some people are saying the inauguration must not hold because of the many issues that are happening. And even others are saying, if these issues need to be trashed, they should be trashed before May 29th. Well, we'll be joined by Taiwo Olakpade, a public affairs analyst, who will also be talking with Shegun Shokuton when we return from the break. Welcome back. It's still uh, Plus Politics on Plus TV Africa, and we're looking at what is going on in the political space and how feasible it is that we're going to have a May 29th uh, that will have peace, that will help us move on as a nation. Granted that all the people will come together and do the needful, and then we move on. I did promise you that we're going to be joined by Taiwo Olapade, and he has just joined us here to also join the Shegun Shokwiton to talk on what is going on in our political space. Taiwo, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, uh, well, we're talking with Shegun and trying to answer some questions that we're asking ourselves. We're just trying to wrap our heads around what is happening now. We, we see in the Labour Party there's a problem. We see in the PDP there's a problem. We see even in the APC that has been declared winners of the presidential election, there is a problem. Some word excos are, uh, are suspending some people, some things. A lot of things are just happening within the parties and between the parties. And we're looking at how we can solve these problems before the day of inauguration <laughs> and then move on. Why do you think these things are happening now? And what is the possible outcome you think will be out of all this thing? Uh, well, we are having this crisis within parties because most of the political parties in the country, they lack internal democracy. And that's where democracy starts from. If within your political arena, you cannot organize a free and fair election where a winner will emerge, no, then how will it be possible for you if you contest against another political party and you lost at that election? How will you, you know, Accept you know, the conduct of that exercise. If within your own political party you lack internal democracy, and that's where all these the, the, the fallouts, the Wula Balu, the, the crisis, uh, you know, started from, you will see a scenario where a candidate that people think is the people's choice, you know, you know. Uh, you know, declaring intention to contest for a political party, you know, the ticket, say governorship ticket, is a popular candidate. But the leadership of the party may not want that candidate, may not want that candidate at that point. And in the other way around, you see another candidate imagine as the candidate of the, another aspirant, imagine the candidate of that party going into election. And maybe by paraventure, they may lose at that election because they have not fielded 
the choice of the people. Mm -hmm. But the leadership, who handles, who is in charge of the party, party's machinery, would take a decision and say, this is the person that we want. Maybe because money has exchanged hands, or for another reason that we may not know of. But basically, the reason why we have challenges across party line, there is no party as we speak now that does not have one challenge or the other. Now we are talking about electing the leadership of National Assembly. And we know that by, 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 by the arrangement, the leadership of the National Assembly, particularly the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, the arrangement we have is the party with the largest number of uh, elected representatives. Mm -hmm. We have about, of course, we have had majority of the House of Reps election uh, during the February 25th, but we still have some uh, uh, staggered election because of the fallout, the crisis, mm -hmm. you know, here and there. But as we speak, APC have about uh, 160 uh, elected House of Rep members. PDP has about uh, 106 or 100, and other political parties. But if you look at it, this is not the kind of scenario that we had in 2019. In 2019, APC won the majority that nobody will contest with them, you know, when it comes to choosing the leadership. But this one, if you put the opposition political parties together, they have more elected representatives than the 160. You know, House of Rep is made up of 360 uh, members. But as, as we speak right now, there is possibility that if APC does not put its house in order, opposition party may become the speaker of the House of Reps. But for the Senate, uh, one of nine senators, we have about 50 APC senators elect at the moment. We have about 20-something uh, yeah, you know, for PDP, Labour, uh, NMPP, uh, Social Democratic Party, ABGA sharing the remaining and we have about about uh, a few number of uh senate seats will be also filled uh, in the coming uh, staggered election but i'm just saying that because we lack internal democracy and you know we have close about uh, seven senators seven top ranking senators that are jostling to become the senate president including ahmed lawa who is about also finishing uh, his first time as a Senate president. Mm. How come that this political party cannot agree and support one candidate among them? So that's where the crisis starts from. And I, and I said that because they lack internal democracy, and we continue to have this problem until we get to a point that the party will agree, a con maybe a consensus candidate, or if possible, they could also organize uh, a primary election that will be not just be seen to be free, but free and fair in all ramifications, so that there won't be any rancor going into a general election. But in the case we continue to have some people being, being foised on other members of the political party, definitely uh, there will be crisis. The crisis within political party is more than crisis between APC and PDP. The one we did, the crisis within APC or PDP or labor or APGA, as the case may be, is that goes beyond the crisis APC is having with labor or PDP is having uh, with APC or NMPP is having with uh, PDP. The crisis within is more. And if you don't resolve the crisis within, how will you be able to, to forge a common ground to fight the enemy? Now, it, it's, it's a worrisome thing. Let, let me just ask both of you now, because when we, when we talk about demo, democracy, we will... We'll be looking at, you know, trying to iron out a lot of things, the way the people behave, not just political parties and all that. And we're trying to build a democracy that will be built on ideology and so many other things that are globally accepted. And then you come back to Nigeria and you see a situation where because a political uh, personality or a, a politician in a particular place was not able to deliver his word. Mm -hmm. He will be branded an anti-party person mm -hmm. and maybe removed from the party, which means the next elect, uh, election cycle, mm -hmm. he, will, he will resort to a do or die affair so that he will retain his position. Mm -hmm. What will that do to our democracy? <laughs> How we need to begin to talk about what kind of harm that kind of a thing is 
to our democracy and what needs to be done to both the parties and the people who make these as a yardstick to belong to a party you must deliver your word whether the, the, whether by crook or by <laughs> any means just deliver your party let's just know the implication of actions like these to a democracy that we are trying to protect let me start with you uh, shock with on can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. All right. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, um, it's a very critical question that you asked. Uh, but democracy, I think it's important that we understand that democracy uh, should be first and foremost about participation, about the freedom of association, freedom of speech, uh, participation in the process of governance. Uh, elections are only a small subset of the entire democratic experience. Um, unfortunately, and in line with what, what you just before, uh, what we have in Nigeria is a situation where elections are almost the um, uh, all in all of our democratic experience. Once the elections are over, uh, the, 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 the idea of democracy, as far as politicians are concerned, ends. And you then have um, rulership taking over. Uh, so now, when you have a situation where politicians don't even seem to grasp the essence of democracy, it's first of all about participation. Uh, you know, then you have a situation where uh, these types of tendencies that you speak about are begin to rear, and that would play very dangerous questions going into the future. So, um, first of all, I think our politicians need to be reminded that the fact that I use my polling unit or that I use my word does not make me less of an asset to my part because there is more in the democratic process than that election. If I win 10 votes from my polling unit or 2,000 votes from my local government or my board, I have contributed to the total number of votes that my party won the entire election. And let's not also forget that this is supposed to be teamwork. So I don't understand where uh, you know, these parties are coming from when they say all these things. However, I think it's important to, to note the context within which this ugly trend has reacted. In the past, yes, we have had uh, prominent politicians lose either their polling units or their wards or even their states, you know, and people lampoon them, you know, over that. Um, but in this particular election, it has become particularly more prominent because politicians in some parts are openly fraternizing with, um, or with candidates in other parts. And there is a very huge example, the elephant in the room, River State. Dr. Wike, who is one of the most prominent members of the PDP, perhaps it can be argued that it's maybe even the strongest member and the, the life force of that party, actively worked against the presidential candidate of the PDP in this election. He ensured that the APC won, defeated the PDP in his own state. Now, is that anti-party activity? Well, no, you know, he, he openly canvassed against his own party. So you also have to call that a question. Because, you know, if, if you have um, people who are deliberately working against the interests of their own party, then how can we trust them to work for the uh, generality of Nigeria? Uh, but, 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 Mr. Shokoto, let me... Is that not supposed to be what democracy is about? Are you not supposed to, you know... Even if your party is doing something and you, you find out that it doesn't align with what you think is the best for the country, for instance and you opt out and join uh, hands with uh, someone or a group that feels that they can do it through another means, and then you openly declare it. Is that not supposed to be what democracy is? Must, yes. you, must you follow and just take hook, line, and sinker just because it is your political party? Look, um, democracy is there is freedom of association, right? But once you have associated, I think that the brand of democracy that we must practice is a brand where there is an ideology and there is ethics and there is some sort of honor and integrity. I cannot stay within one political party and deliberately work against the interests of that party. 
if you believe that that party um, is not towing the line that you believe in and you do not support where they're going, you have the option, as it is allowed in any democracy, to resign your membership. You can even join another party and work for them. What I don't understand is the situation where you stay within one party, work against the interest of that party in one election, and then work for the interest of that party in the next election, in the same election cycle. I think we cannot afford to encourage that type of practice. I, I think, you know, and, and again, uh, I need to point out that this has happened in this election because, you know, we're seeing an unprecedented scenario where a candidate has emerged or a number of candidates have emerged that have the national presence, the national clout to win the presidential elections and they are garnering support across political divides. That's why we see this tendency that we're seeing. However, I think that it should not be encouraged. I think that people should be encouraged to deal and play with integrity so that you know, we don't then continue to encourage the idea that politics is a, is a dirty game and do whatever it takes to take the I'm not sure that would be a justified. In other crimes, politicians behave honorably, at least in the public space. Whatever they do behind the scenes, their business. But in the public space, they're expected to behave honorably. And where they fail to do so, even they will resign based on public pressure, and I think we need to move in that direction. Okay, uh, because our time is uh, going uh, very fast and there are other things that we need to cover. Um, my, uh, my question to you is, do you think the political actors uh, in our country right now are doing what they are supposed to do to bring about the healing that we need right now? For instance, the president-elect, is he doing enough? Is he talking enough? Is he, is he giving us enough body language that will tell us that he really needs this peace? Mm -hmm. uh, the people who are in the opposition who also claim that they want the unity of this country, they want peace in this country, are they doing enough? What else could, do they need to do to make sure that we arrive at that peace that we so desire? Uh, well, before I provide answer to, do, to, to that question, just permit me to quickly uh, give two examples of... Uh, the way politicians leave one party for another party because of lack of internal democracy. Mm -hmm. Senator Ian Abaribe has been representing Abia South since 2007 on the platform of the PDP. PDP. In the build-up to 2023 elections, he was denied the ticket of that same Abia South because the outgoing governor, Governor Okeze Kuyazu, was also interested to go to the Senate. Mm. What did he do? He left the PDP for him to take the ticket of Abga. And he won the sitting governor hands down. And that shows that people of Abia South love Senator Ejinaya Abaribe. It's about what I was, we are discussing about, in lack of internal democracy within political space. Another example is Abdul Jubri Mumin. He has been also around in the House of Reps for three times. That's about 12 years. In the build-up to this election, he left the PDP to join APC, but very close to uh, the 2015 election, February, February, February 25th. Mm. He left APC again to take the ticket of a Labour Party. And today, he has been re-elected on the platform of the Labour Party. But come to your question. The body language of the president-elect, Ashwa Jibola Tinumo, that I see, that I know, I think is ready to also ensure that um, he extend in his inaugural speech. He said it loud and clear that he's extending hands of fellowship, brotherhood. Yeah, but beyond that inaugural speech, after that till this moment, has he done enough? I want to believe uh, with his body language that Ashiwaju will form a cabinet that will represent all the overall interests of this country. And what do we need? We need a government of national, of national unity, fine, for integral, you know, uh, integration of the entire country. But we also need people to also come on board on merit, because at the moment now, we, we are at the crossroad. We need people who have the credibility, who have the capacity to deliver, okay. and not just uh, the, the, the yeah, of uh, right. man knows right. man. Yeah. We need people, you, you, the people should be selected on merit, and not because I know you, you know me. We, we are at the crossroad, and if we are not careful, and that's exactly what we are talking about now, to choose the leadership of National Assembly is becoming problematic, even for the ruling party. 
we okay. should have the interests of the people and the nation at heart. And that's the only way Ashwaji can succeed on this mandate that has been given to him by but hate the Lord, endurance or thereabouts. Okay, uh, Mr. Shokotan, we have one minute uh, left now. Do you think they're doing enough to make sure to bring about this peace that we want? No, I don't think we're doing enough. I don't think the APC, uh, I don't think the president is doing enough. I don't think the APC and the party is doing enough. Um, I don't think that the Labour Party is doing enough. I think uh, the candidate of the Labour Party, Mr. Peter Obia, you know, a very consistent message. But the other, and I think as far back, have also been consistent. But the parties themselves need to rein their members in. The APC and Ashwai Kola who need to ramp up the message of the conciliation. What we have now is a situation where people like Festus Kayambo and people like um, Femi Panikayode and people like uh, Bayo Onoluga are in the social media space and on air on national TV um, um, basically stoking up sentiment in a situation where people are already feeling aggrieved. You know, so I don't think that the APC in particular is sending out enough of a conciliatory message. I think we need to do better than that. And I also want to say to the people in especially Labour Party supporters that we should not uh, continue to project a message of a Armageddon that it is Peter Obi or there is no Nigeria. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing. We are in court and I think that we need to rein our emotions in and hopefully continue to put pressure on the Supreme Court and the uh, you know the judiciary to ensure that justice, you know, and then hopefully you know we can navigate these delicate days ahead. So I, I think we need to do more of that. Okay, there's been calls that um, whatever the problem is, all the litigations, everything should be resolved before May 29. Maybe that is not a possibility, but we do hope that we will still have this Nigeria standing and we will be united even more than ever before to build our country to the El Dorado of our dreams. Thank you so much, Mr. Shegun Shokpaton, for coming on the program today. Thank you, Bob. And also, Mr. Taiwo uh, Lapade, thank you so much for being a part Thanks of our so program. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, we do hope that we'll return tomorrow with yet another uh, edition, another topic to, to discuss. Until then, on behalf of the entire team of Plus Politics, my name is Nyamgul Agaji. Thank you for being there. <laughs>